Welcome to FPL Mate, your best mate for fantasy Premier League content for the 2022-23 season. My name is Dan and today we are back at it with a buy, sell, keep, avoid video for game week 9. So I feel like game week 9 is, is really around the corner. Now, the buy, sell, keep, avoid videos are back. It's, it's time. It's time to start thinking about FPL. So if you're excited for FPL to finally return, it feels like it's been ages, particularly for some teams who haven't played for so long. If you're excited, please do hit the like button. It really helps out the channel. And do subscribe if you're new around here as well. But without further ado, let's have a look at the rules of the video. So buys are players you probably don't have but should consider bringing in, sells are players you probably have but should consider removing, keeps are players you probably might be thinking of removing but I think you should keep them, and finally avoids are players that are pretty hyped up right now, I think they are players that could, could potentially be avoided, I think they could be traps that maybe you shouldn't go for, and they're, they're the controversial ones that I'm, I'm always excited to share for, with you, I'm always excited about the discussion around the avoids, it's, it's always a bit of a fun one. So let's get started with some buys for game week 9. Our first buy is James Madison. No surprise here. Back-to-back -back fixtures against Nottingham Forest and Bournemouth. That is really, really nice indeed. We know those are two teams that we really want to be targeting at the moment. And we've got that Leeds fixture in game week 12 as well. So this run of fixtures is really nice for those Leicester players. And I know people don't like Leicester right now for good reason. But in terms of their attack, their attack has been, you know, absolutely fine. There's been nothing wrong with the attack. They've just been conceding a lot of goals. So going for those more attacking players, I think could be really, really good. Now, those of you who watch James Madison against Spurs will have seen just how good he was. He was absolutely scintillating in that game. Really exciting and kind of gave the impression that he's hit one of those spells of form that when you get Madison during these runs, we actually had two of these runs for Madison last season. One uh, around Christmas time and then another one kind of uh, towards the end of the season where Madison was just scoring points after points after points. When he hits those runs of form and you feel like he's just beginning to go into one of them, then you've got to have him, especially when the fixtures are this good. Really seriously so good. Madison, I know people have said that he hasn't had the greatest season so far but I actually tend to disagree with that. I think he scored uh, three goals and one assist is it in, in, the, in the seven games that he's played so far which is pretty nice to be fair. You know, four returns in seven games. You don't you don't turn that down at all, especially when you consider Leicester have had some difficult fixtures. So this run of fixtures I think is a good, really good time to own Madison. I would even consider going for Madison as a real differential captain. I'm not saying it's a sensible move. Definitely not a sensible move in fact but if you're looking to get ahead of the pack go for Madison he's a real differential at the moment that a lot of people are actually struggling to fit into their team but I, I definitely would be going for him Callum Wilson I've got up next I know a lot of people are looking for the forward to go for and I thought I would suggest someone a little bit different because we have got a situation where players like Isaac we're not sure if he's going to be available for game week nine or not so you may be looking to make a, a, a switch on Isaac depending on his fitness and his availability and even if he is available we feel like he may move to the wing now Wilson I am expecting to be fit for game week nine I think he's going to be ready we'll obviously get confirmation on that later on in the week but he's a player that I want you guys to be keeping a close eye on because we when he is in, you know, in, in good health, which I believe he is now, he is an absolutely insane player. We know how many goals he can score. And when, when we have like all of these players around him coming back to fitness as well, Isaac is, when he comes back, he's going to be a real good support for Wilson on the wing. We're going to have Bruno Guimaraes. We're going to have Sam Maxman involved as well. And it's really going to boost Newcastle, allow Newcastle to thrive. We're expecting a big season from them. And Callum Wilson is going to be at the heart of it, really at the center of it, scoring those goals. He's going to be on penalties as well. And every Everything is going to be very, very good as long as he can stay fit. So maybe you're kind of concerned about his fitness. If you are worried that he's going to get re-injured, for me, so what? You know, if Haaland was injury prone, and we do consider Haaland to be an injury prone player, that doesn't mean you don't want to own him at the times when he is fit. So if you're owning a, a player like Haaland, I know he's not quite the same level, don't get me wrong, but if you're happy to own a player like that, then Wilson, I feel like, is a step below the same kind of concept when he's fit. He's a player who is amazing to own. Not many people are going for him. He's really super differential and one of those players that could really boost you up the rank. So for me personally, um, aside from the obvious uh, forward picks, he's that kind of slightly differential forward pick that I actually really, really like the look of and think could do really quite well, actually. So uh, kind of uh, envious of anyone who is going to have Wilson in their team going into game week nine and beyond because the fixtures aren't bad. I think he can do quite well. Onto themselves, Kulisevsky would be the first player I would consider selling. I mean, obviously, you guys are going to want to sell your injured players first over the international break. It seems like a couple of injuries have been picked up, but aside from them, you know, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna patronise you guys by saying sell injured players. 
Obviously, you want to sell players who aren't even available to play because they're injured. But if we're looking at some of these other players that are not injured, that you still might want to consider selling, Kulusevski for me would be up there, mostly because I feel like his position in the team is at serious risk right now. We've seen some good form from, uh, obviously, uh, Kane and, and uh, Richarlison. They've been in some really good form so far this season. And Son is just coming off the back of a hat trick from game week eight. So he's probably going to be back into the team as well, especially in the, a difficult game against Arsenal. So it kind of leaves Kulusevski as a bit of a rotation risk. Is Kulusevski not going to play? Is Richarlison going to play? Are they going to rotate? That's probably the most likely scenario that they're going to rotate. But So you're going to get limited minutes from Kulusevski. You're not going to get the maximum amount of minutes. And for 8.1 million... You really do want a player who is playing every single game week, getting those opportunities every single game week. And even when Kulusevski is playing, it's not like he's been at the forefront of Spurs' his goals. You know, Spurs score a lot of goals. And typically, Kulusevski hasn't been involved in too many of them. And when he has been involved, it has been assists as well. So you can look through the, the stats here, guys. 0.36 expect, uh, expected goals over the last uh, five game weeks. That's not great, really, is it? Like, you, you kind of want a little bit more for, for the money that you pay there. So over Overall, I don't really like Kulusevski as a pick. I think if you have got Kulusevski, I think he's the perfect player to switch to a Madison, and that's exactly what I would be doing. Pascal Gross is a really interesting one. Obviously, he had some really good form a, a while ago. And I say a while ago because it's actually going to be a month between the last time Pascal Gross played a professional game of football uh, to game week nine, pretty much. So that is a long, long time. Um, you know, when a player is in hot form, they do often need consistent games to continue that form. And it's going to be essentially like Pascal Gross starting again. You know, it's like he's starting the season again. So I don't know if I'm fully convinced that he's going to be able to recapture that form that he showed previously. Of course, he's under new management as well. So is he going to be deployed slightly differently in a new system? I think that's very, very possible as well. We don't know. Kroos has typically played in a kind of more of a box-to-box -box type midfielder role rather than a second striker role that we've seen from him so far this season. So it's very difficult to say how well Brighton will perform, first of all. And second of all, how Gross will perform and where he will play on the pitch. On top of that, we've got two back-to-back -back difficult fixtures against Liverpool and Spurs so all in all it's kind of difficult for me to recommend uh, keeping Gross right now because there's so much mystery around him and I think the safe thing to do is probably to remove him and go for someone a little bit safer a little bit more reliable perhaps now we have got two reasonably good fixtures in the game week 11 and 12 uh, but after that in game week 13 uh, Brighton play against Manchester City and then uh, 14 is Chelsea I believe so even though we've got that Brentford game we've got that Nottingham Forest game in between there it kind of feels like the next six there is really a lot of difficult opponents in there for Gross as well. So with the fixtures looking bad, we don't really know how they're going to set up. We don't really know how Gross is going to be fitting into this team. It's very difficult to say uh, that I would recommend Gross right now. So for that reason, I'm going to put him down as a sell. Luis Diaz, on the other hand, I'm going to put down as a keep because I kind of do, I kind of do like the look of, of of Liverpool potentially going into this Brighton game because, like I said, this Brighton game is a, a game where we're going to be battling up against a mysterious Brighton. We don't really know for sure how well they're going to do after this very long break and under new management as well. And Luis Diaz has really been the star of the show for me uh, for Liverpool. I'm sure you guys will agree that if there's one standout player in a fairly disappointing Liverpool season, it has been Luis Diaz. So I think he. He can continue his good form um you know he scored a, a few goals already this season in all competitions of course and uh, i don't see why he couldn't continue that a little bit and uh you know get another one in some some of the, uh, some of these games i mean brighton is a good game after that the fixtures do look a little more bleak so i'm not suggesting that you have to keep Luis diaz long term but to be fair, even, you know, we've got West Ham in game week 12. We've got, you know, good fixture in game week 13 as well. So there is opportunity to keep Diaz for a slightly longer term if you wanted to. But certainly for this game week, I think it's it's a, a, a really a time where we could maybe give Liverpool players one more chance in a way. It's been a little break since they last played. Um, they could be improved. They could be back to normal. The, the management there, the club there, certainly going to be hoping they can get their season back on track. A fresh start kind of thing after this long break. So I wonder... I wonder could Liverpool do the business against Brighton I think they could and if they do it's going to be Luis Diaz likely to be involved you know Salah could be involved as well I don't mind Salah for this game week either I'm not saying I'm not suggesting buying him necessarily but if I had Salah if I had Luis Diaz if I had Trent Alexander-Arnold these are the kind of the players that I would actually be giving a chance for game week nine I think but let me know what you think about that where do you stand on Liverpool players right now do you think they can get something out of this Brighton game uh, are you looking to sell him this week are you looking to sell him after that for me I would keep them for this game week certainly then maybe reconsider after that um, but certainly I think before long we are going to have Liverpool players back on our lips 
And another keep is uh, Mitrovic, which I was kind of confused why he's been sold by so many people, but already so far this game week, before the game week nine deadline, we're seeing uh, around 100,000 people already transfer out Mitrovic. And I, I'm kind of wondering why that is. I think he's been brilliant. I know a lot of people are going to be very disappointed, obviously, um, last game against Nottingham Forest. Um, Mitrovic didn't score in that game, despite Fulham scoring three goals. But I kind of take that as a positive. Fulham are still scoring goals. Uh, Mitrovic has still been in some very good form. We saw him score a hat-trick over the international break against Sweden. He's picked up a, a very, very minor uh, knock, I suppose. But all of the talk is that it's not going to affect his game time. He is going to come straight back in in game week nine. Uh, this is a player who will play through anything. He'll play through the pain. He really just wants to play, get out there and score some goals and prove himself. So far, he's done brilliantly improving himself. He's a goal-scoring machine. We saw that in the championship last season. We're seeing that on international duty. And we're now we're seeing it in the Premier League as well. So there's no way I'd be selling Mitrovic. I'd even be buying him if I didn't have him already. I know a lot of you guys do have him, but I would seriously consider getting him in. I know this Newcastle fixture on paper isn't amazing, but it seems like a home game, like Fulham are scoring goals. I don't think Newcastle are completely impenetrable. And if, if someone's going to score, it's, it's got to be Mitrovic, right? So I kind of like the look of this one. I, th I think he could do quite well in some of these fixtures. And certainly for game week 11, game week 12, these are fixtures you're going to really want to have Mitrovic in your team for. So um, if it means keeping him, even if you're not fully convinced by Newcastle or West Ham, uh, th these fixtures, I would still keep him. Just run through these games because I think he can nick a one goal in even the toughest fixtures. And he's already shown that so far this season, nicking goals against, you know, Liverpool, against Spurs. He, he can do it in any game. So uh, yeah, definitely a keep for me. Da -da 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 -da. Avoid. Um, yeah, I'm sorry to spoil the fun on this one. I know Saliba is the number one most transferred in player of the game week, but I'm putting him in to the avoid section. Get the pitchforks out, boys, but here we go. Let me try and give my explanation why I don't really fancy Saliba. So, okay, obviously we've seen him score a very big point. A point score was at 15 points in game week eight, and that is always a player. You know, when I, when I def this happens so often, a defender will score like a 15 point or something like that in a game week and everyone will rush to buy them and then they'll quickly realize that this player does not score 15 points every game week. Now, I don't dispute that Arsenal are a reasonably good defense uh, so far this season, but when the, when uh, you know Saliba for example, when he has come up against some of the tougher uh, attacks I suppose so far this season, and by tougher attacks I mean Leicester and Manchester uh, United, he scored minus 1 points and he scored 0 points in those two games against even the slightly difficult attacks. Now we're going up against Tottenham Hotspur with the likes of Son and Kane. And we've got Liverpool with the likes of, you know, Luis Diaz and Salah in there. It is kind of difficult to say that Arsenal are going to keep a clean sheet over this next two games. And I say that as an Arsenal fan. I don't think Arsenal are going to keep a clean sheet. And after that, we really are dependent on goals, I suppose. You know, uh, you know, at the attacking threat from corners and the like. Yes, it's possible for Saliba to score goals from corners, but he's actually only taken three shots so far this season. He's running at an XG of 0.57 and he scored two goals. Uh, no, 0.37, sorry. And he scored two goals from that. 0.57 for the assist and he's got one assist. Now, looking at these stats, for this super low XG and super low XA, even the best players in the world, even your Lionel Messi's, your well, Cristiano Ronaldo is peak, they do not reach the heights of this. They do not keep consistently score goals at this rate with XG so, so low. So it's difficult for me to say that a centre-back that is not typically known historically for scoring goals is going to keep up this consistency with, 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 with scoring goals. So looking at these fixtures, clean sheets are in doubt. I'm not convinced that Saliba will continue this attacking threat. The, st the, the, the stats don't back it up. When you look at the goals that he scored, it, they don't look like they can be real consistent returns. They will happen occasionally. Don't get me wrong. But it's very difficult to predict when they're going to happen. But if you are going to predict when they're going to happen, these tough fixtures, again, are not the ones, not the fixtures you would necessarily predict that Saliba will score or assist in. So that's, um, that's my spiel on that one. For me, I'm not saying that he's a sell necessarily. I think you could consider selling him. Don't get me wrong. But to buy a player 4.9 million that's not exactly cheap anymore uh, against these tough fixtures really you do want to be targeting some easier fixtures when you're going for your defenders and um yeah i just don't think i would go for saliba right now I, I think that is placing far too much faith in arsenal's defense which i know historically no one will be thinking about doing but you know he's got a cool song and he scored 15 points um, last week so i guess that's enough reason to hype up a player 
And my final avoid is Mac Allister. So Alexis Mac Allister, he's back in again in the avoid section because he's again one of the most popular transfers in this game week. Um, I, I want to talk about Mac Allister and how he scored his FPL points, which has pretty much been three penalties. It, it really has. It's been three penalties. Well, it, in the last you know five six game weeks, four penalties, well three penalties and a free kick, I believe it is. So that's um. No goals from open play and it's not even any real contributions from open play So he's taken zero shots in the box in open play. He's made zero big uh, big chances in from open play his XG I know you can see on screen. This is his XG including penalties is 2.52 Which is pretty decent, but without penalties his XG is all the way down at 0.27 So that's even less than Saliba. He's like from open play He's even less of a goal threat than Saliba and I'm not convinced that he's going to be able to keep it up, uh, you know, unless Brighton get a lot more penalties, which, I don't know, we've got some two tough fixtures here, we've got Liverpool, we've got Spurs, these are tough fixtures, I don't know really that, that they're going to get more penalties, and that's really the only way you're going to get points from McAllister, if that's okay with you, if you're happy to just pick a player and hope that they score penalties, then, you know, fair enough, I completely understand, we don't even completely know how uh, McAllister is going to be deployed, but so far this season, he's been a defensive midfielder, like, which is why his open play contributions have been so low, so for me, McAllister is similar to, you know, a uh, Jorginho maybe, I know a lot of you guys wouldn't consider putting Jorginho in your FPL team, because you understand that the only way he's going to get FPL points is through scoring penalties, and the fact that McAllister happens to have had a lot of penalties so far this season, don't think it's necessarily an indication that Brighton are going to continue to get one penalty a game, you know, one penalty every other game. I don't think that's going to happen necessarily. And for that reason, um, McAllister, I, I think, has to go down as the final avoid of this video. 0.27 expected goals from open play is just not enough for me. You can, you can, you can do better. You can do better. Okay, just as, as an overview, a summary, I suppose, I would wait a little while longer to make your transfers if possible because I think we could get some decent news at the end of this week from press conferences in regards to who is available, who has been injured over at the international break because it's always a bit of a mysterious time this time of year where we kind of, we're not really sure who, who, who actually is injured. You know, players will be returning to their teams early. You know, we know Arsenal are going to have some decent defensive problems as well. A few players potentially injured there, which I guess is another reason not to take Saliba. You know, with, without Thomas Partey, with perhaps the absence of Zinchenko or Tierney. Not sure how available they're going to be. I think it's looking reasonably good on Zinchenko's part, but still, um, you know, there are some defensive fragilities there and this is going to happen between all kinds of different teams. You know, this is another reason why, you know, if we know that Arsenal have got defensive issues, maybe that pushes us towards Spurs players for this next game week, etc, etc, etc. So a lot of information is going to come out between now and the end of the game week. Stay patient. Keep an eye on those key players indeed. And um, yeah, I think, I think you'll do fine. Uh, I think you'll do absolutely fine with a bit of patience and selecting the right players. And that's the end of the video. Don't forget to check out uh, Fantasy Football Hub, who provided all of the stats for this video. I'll leave a link to their Opta Stats tool that I use to gather the data for these videos. I'll leave a link to that at the top of the description as well. Do make sure you like the video. It really helps out. Subscribe. Um, did I already say that? I don't know. But um, yeah, also going to be continuing to stream on Twitch, doing some FIFA 23 stuff and a little bit of FPL talk over there. I'm pretty much live every day at the moment on Twitch playing Twitch FIFA 23. So do go check that out if you want to. Again, link will be in the description. You might have to scroll down a little bit to find it but it's it's there uh, but yeah that's pretty much it for me today we're going to be coming at you tomorrow with an 100 experts video which is always my most useful video for me personally uh but yeah see you guys there and i'll see you later mates bye bye